Vanderbilt Virtual School. We're located in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a beautiful spring day here in Tennessee. The trees are blooming and the flowers are blooming and it's going to be in the 80s today. So we're loving it. And I hope it's a beautiful day where you are. Um, this is a series that we call Hot Topics. And Hot Topics can be anything that's cutting edge, a little controversial, or just something that you want to know more about. Uh, we have lots of different series here in the virtual school, but um, this is one that you will have a lot of interaction. Um, joining me today is Kanayo Odo. He is from Nigeria. He is a law student here at Vanderbilt University. He's going to complete his education here at Vanderbilt in May and then return to Nigeria. He came to Howard University where he got a BS in chemistry and then he got a master's in chemical engineering which will serve him well as he goes back to Nigeria to face some of the problems that are there. Um, we're so glad to have him with us. Uh, next week we're having another video conference in the Hot Topic series called Into Africa and the AIDS Crisis and we'll have Mark Dalhouse and some Vanderbilt students joining us. Uh, these students went to Uganda uh, last summer and worked in the AIDS clinics, uh, worked in surgery and different things, stayed a whole semester, and so they're coming to talk to us about the AIDS crisis. And something I want you to think about if you choose to join us is why that's happening in Africa, why the AIDS crisis has got such a hold on Africa as opposed to other countries. Um, is there something culturally or what, what is there that's causing the, the dynamics of that to occur on that continent? So we hope you can join us again for that. Uh, Kanayo is, uh, like I said, from Nigeria. He has an insightful uh, way to see into problems of Africa that even you and I probably don't see because he's part of the land. He's lived there. This is, this is the blood of Africa flows through him. And so he has got some really interesting observations. Often we tend to think, oh, it's just it's AIDS or it's civil unrest or it's poverty. And it is. It's all of those things. But uh, what can we do, what can Africans do to help solve their problems? A couple of things I want to remind you, um, and, and I did, never thought that this could have a downside until I heard him, over 80% of the world's resources for gold, diamonds, oil are in Africa. How has that played into the governing, the civil unrest of Africa? And also, he'll give us just a little bit about the history of Africa and how the countries were put together. So we're so glad to have you with us. Thank you. Uh huh. Again, uh, hi. My name is Kanayo Dwe. I uh, lived 20 years of my life, close to, in Nigeria before uh, coming to the United States to uh, pursue a higher education. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I came to the U.S. was to, in 96, 96, and the reason for this was there was civil unrest. We had a dictatorship, and the people were tired of the dictatorship. The, the university started to close down in reaction for their disgust at the dictatorship. And for that reason, uh, I was given the opportunity to come to the United States to study along with thousands of other Nigerians uh, whose family had the means or the resources to do so. Now, the question is, why do we have the issues plaguing Africa today? That is the question. That is why we're here today to dialogue. There are three phases in the life of Africa. Pre-colonial, colonial, and then post-colonial. I wouldn't bother with pre-colonial, and that has to do with the slave trade and all that. The colonial, I wouldn't bother with it so much. And then post-colonial. What happened in post-colonial Africa? Well, after World War II, a lot of African countries started to agitate for their independence. And in agitation, the colonial powers, England, France, uh, I think Portugal, started to see their powers. They left and said, okay, you know what, we'll give you independence. But before they left, 
England, France, perhaps Portugal, did something remarkable. A lot of African countries are actually artificial countries. You have actually six, seven countries in one unit or one country. Nigeria, for example. Nigeria is a country made up of six major ethnic groups. So you actually have six countries in one country. Sierra Leone, the same thing. Liberia, the same thing. Uh, when the freed slaves from the United States went back, they, constitu they constituted another ethnic group or were viewed as such by the people in Liberia at the time, the indigenous uh, Liberians. And then we look at Rwanda, right? We heard about the war in Rwanda where the Hutsis, the Tutsis, those are two major ethnic groups in one country called Rwanda. And then let's not look too far back. Let's even look at Iraq. Same thing that happened in Iraq in the 1914. In 1914, when the British left, what did they do? They put the Sunnis and the Shia. Though not an ethnic group, they have separate religious beliefs, right? And now, what do you have? You now see what's going on in Iraq, right? Killings, bombings, people killing each other because they are different. They are different people. I want you to imagine this. You think about England. Or let's, let's think about the United States. Can you imagine what will happen if the U.S. merged with Mexico and Canada as one country? Don't they just break up? I mean, okay, if you, if you can't get along with yourselves, just split into your et different ethnic groups. But there's a catch. A lot of African countries are blessed with natural resources. Oil, gold, diamond, you name it. It's those countries are blessed. So what happens is certain ethnic groups don't have the kind of resources the other ethnic groups have. So the, when a country an African country wants to split. An ethnic group won't want to split because it relies on the natural resources of the other areas in that, uh, of that country. Now, in order to hold a country together, in order to hold a country together for it not to split, what, do you, what, what happens? You now have a dictator that emerges, right? Now, dictatorship usually is the solution for holding African countries together. Now, when you have the dictators, a natural birth of dictatorship, a, na a child of dictatorship is corruption. And once you have a dictator, it slowly degenerates into corruption. I mean, you would have heard uh, Iraq, what happened when the U.S. forces invaded Iraq. Saddam Saddam's uh, four the men walked into the, the banks, the reserve, and just took out money as they wished. And this is what happens in every dictatorship. Now, when you have a dictatorship for, say, 10, 15 years, corruption starts to thrive. Before you know it, the people, you have a, a culture of corruption. And anywhere there is injustice, I mean, it has been proved time and time again, up until the works of the great Greek philosopher, Socrates, who said, when you have injustice, there is bound to be strife. You will never have a successful nation anytime there is injustice. And that is what has plagued or is plaguing Africa today. Hopefully, there's a push towards change with democracy, but it will take time. Now, you would have heard, and you should know, that some of the... Uh, Issues in Africa include genocide, poor government structure, healthcare issues, epidemics, and economic structure. I could delve into those separate issues, but I wouldn't. I, I will, in the course of our dialogue, you will ask me questions, but I will push and say, I'll be bold enough to say that the main issue plaguing Africans today is corruption. There is a 
uh, a, a fellow in Nigeria who helps, he now works with the UN, or he should be working with the UN, in trying to stop corruption in African countries. To everyone's shocking amazement, he says, in his own words, Africa loses $140 billion every year to corruption. A lot of the leaders or rulers loot their countries and then send their money overseas. And then anytime they fall sick, they don't spend time trying to develop their nations or their systems. They fly out to get health care. When they want to go on holidays, they want to take in a clean breath of fresh air, they fly out to the West. No one, or rather, no ruler at this point, other than Julius Unyerere of Tanzania in the uh, 80s, took time to develop their nation. Some have tried, but again, a lot of times in Africa we've had dictatorships. What happens when you come in through a bloody coup, you leave through a bloody coup. When you, a lot of dictators come and they come in with a coup and they're ousted with a coup. So, and we've had situations in Nigeria where we had a very good leader at the time. He was a dictator by the name of Buhari. He tried, he tried to clean Nigeria of corruption, but he didn't last too long. Another dictator came in and took him out. So this is the issue. This is what has plagued Nigeria. Uh, because of corruption, greed, you have leaders who come and they take a side and loot their country of the natural resources. And then what happens? At a, a point, the people say enough is enough. And then what happens? You have genocide. Uh, the economic infrastructure breaks down. We also know that healthcare is a serious issue in Nigeria. Uh, the question is, I mean, what is there in healthcare, right? You build your hospitals, you put your doctors in there. But there's a problem. Af Africa is in the tropics. It's a tropical region. And like most tropics, they have the issue of malaria, typhoid, mm -hmm. cholera, waterborne diseases, airborne diseases. So even if you have this nice hospital or set of nice doctors those doctors won't focus on the real or rather serious diseases like diabetes cancer fractures of the bones in times of accidents because they will have a swarm of other cases like malaria patient the patients or uh, people afflicted with th typhoid so the system, the healthcare system, can't sustain itself. So what can we do to solve this problem? In my view, we have to go back and study other nations that have done, of, or other nations that tackled the problems. In the late, up until the late 1800s in the United States, they had diseases like malaria, cholera, typhoid. They had these tropical diseases in the southern part of the United States. They, they, they solved the issue or eradicated most of these problems through environmental engineering. So the issue now will be an engineering issue, not so much a medical issue. We have to deal with those diseases or those issues, and then we can now deal with the serious issues. And I can hear some people saying, well, if it's that easy, why can't they do it? Well, it still boils down to corruption. And the unfortunate incident or the unfortunate characteristic of African nations is a lot of African nations have not been or rather have not had visionary leaders, people who can look far into the future and say, you know, this is the path we must take. So this is the issue. Poor leadership because of corruption. As long as corruption remains in the air, we will not be able to address some of this serious issues. Corruption breeds strife. And an example of this, like I, I previously stated, will, will be if you had a, in a class students, say the students in the front row, right? Say they, are the, they make the best students in the class. And it 
progressively degenerates from there. In other words, those at the back are not as bright as those at the front. Now, this is just an example now. Uh, and let us say the, the teacher in class, after each exam, gives the best grades to those who are not the brightest. What will happen? At the point in time, all of you in the class will lead a revolt. Because you will say, enough is enough. I've worked so hard. Uh, the professor is giving the better grades to people who are not even doing anything. And the class collapses. You have the strife, which is common. And that's what you're seeing in a lot of African countries today. There's also the notion to, I also hear, you know, people think Africa is one big, con it's one big country. Africa is not a country, but it's a continent. So it has a lot of countries within the continent. It's uh, the second largest continent, continent right? and, Yes, it's the second largest continent in the world. So uh, that being said, I'm open to questions. I haven't run through the uh, statistics to know, you know, how many are children or how many are not, but I do know that regardless of whether they are children or not, you know, it's a big issue plaguing certain regions, most especially in Africa, which will be the southern part of Africa and the eastern part of Africa. Is there a reason that it has been in the south and the east rather than north and west? Um, I don't know. Well, I know in the northern part of Africa, you know, it's very the the issue of AIDS is so it's quite minuscule, and I think it has to do with the cultural and the religious mm -hmm. uh, beliefs. Mm -hmm. So in northern Africa, there are a lot of Muslims. It's more you know conservative lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I think in southern Africa, they are more. They may not be as conservative they may not be as conservative and you know history tells us that the books have told us that the disease started the virus may have started from southern africa eastern africa thereabouts about so, 85 86 yes about mm -hmm. 85 so maybe that may account for why the disease has spread more so in those areas than the other areas okay thank you Uh, the economy will never become strong as long as you have corruption. So the first key issue to tackle will be corruption. And I think the UN is trying. They have a, uh, a convention against corruption now. There's now the push towards addressing the issue of corruption by uh, African leaders who, who loot or steal from their uh, government or their, their nations. She's asking, though, if the corruption got fixed, do you think the other things, like AIDS and civil unrest and things like that, would take care of themselves? Yes, once you deal with the corruption, every other thing falls in place. I mean, they know what the problems are. They know what the problems are. I mean, they read books. Some of them are literate. Some of them are educated. They know what the problems are, but they spend more time trying to connive and trying to... Some of them, not all of them, they are very, very good and great leaders too who are trying to fight the system of what is going on. But the, uh, the stench of corruption is still very strong. So if you deal with the corruption, I think every other thing falls in place, right? Because you start to award or reward good behavior. You start to reward excellence. You start to reward people who are doing well. Now, a lot of African nations... Because the, and the greatest manifestation of corruption we, we see in Africa today is in the electoral process, right? When you have election, a lot of the thugs who work for some of those crooked leaders steal the votes. They don't let the votes, they don't want the votes counted. That's the greatest manifestation of corruption. So what happens when you have... The people saying, you know, this is the leader we want. This is the leader, the good leader. This is the leader who can help our country. The few corrupt ones steal the votes and they put the criminal there or a thug there, the person they want, who they know is corrupt. 
And what happens? You now have that trend, the evil trend, and it keeps happening over and over and over again. So corruption, when I say corruption, I'm just not saying corruption about, you know, concerning stealing not the resources from the states or from the countries. I'm also talking about corruption that goes towards stifling democracy, democracy in its pure form. So once we can deal with those two forms of corruption, one being electoral fraud and the other being looting the government of his... Uh, stealing the, money. Of it, stealing money, pretty much. Then we'll start to see Africa progress. So it's, those are the issues now. So that's why corruption is... Because as long as people don't have their say, you know, you'll never produce the best. You'll not have the leader who will fight for the people. Thank you. I thought about that. I mean, a lot of ifs, a lot of speculations. But I think, I think there is, there is, it's, it's, when you say colonial input, I, you know, <laughs> that's it. I, I like the question. It makes me, it gets me thinking. But there are two, colonialism brought it's good aspects, it brought a good side. So like everything, you right, you have the good and you have the bad. Colonialism brought something good to Africa. Like, you know, in ancient civilizations like Rome, when Rome went, conquered other nations, they brought with them education, they brought with them knowledge. And those, those the education, the knowledge helped those nations thrive or become become strong so without colonialization or colonialism i i just don't know it's hard to say what africa will 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 be today it, it's it's really hard i can't give a definite question because it has its good and has its bad one word gone Gone and also a lot of corrupt companies, multinational companies from the West have helped, you know, keep them in, keep power. Them in power by supplying them arms, giving them money to uh, predate upon their people. So a lot of Western multinational companies have played their own role. As what is going on in, in, in Sudan today, do not the West uh China there are accusations now in the problems in Sudan that that China is fueling some of the crises in Sudan by taking sides or ignoring what is going on in in Sudan so that's how they've been able to hold on to power The only country I can think of committing genocide is, at, at, according to the definition of genocide, because genocide does have a d definition, a legal definition, right? So when you talk of genocide, you're talking about killing a group of people. It has its legal definitions. Now, the only country I can think of committing genocide in Africa today will be Sudan. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, That's the Darfur region. Yeah, the, the, the Darfur region in Sudan. A couple of years back, we had Rwanda. Rwanda. We had uh, Liberia. Mm -hmm. We had Syria alone. So those were the countries. And when I say a couple of years back, we're saying six, seven years ago. Those are the countries. Now, if they didn't have genocide, you're right, they, it would have increased maybe some kind of tourism and uh, people would have more interested in associating with such regions. Good question. I would think education. Mm -hmm. I would right. think education. Because education covers a lot. It frees the mind of people. It develops people's minds, it develops thinking, way of life. It makes people know their rights. It makes people assert their rights. It makes people 
stand for their rights and take what belongs to them. So I will think education will be the one thing that I will take and I hope to take when I go back to, to Nigeria. Thank you for that nice question. Great question. That goes back to the previous question that I just heard. I'm going to raise awareness, try and educate the masses, try and let people know that they have rights. They must demand their rights from their people in power. I will try and educate the people, try and put for legislation, try and let people know that everyone has a right or a stake in their countries, including Nigeria. And the people who they put to govern them must be accountable to the people. So those are things I, I hope uh, to take back. Another thing too I must mention is that the, the structure, the structure, the basis for which a lot of African countries function, right, is poor. Uh, I mean, I would be bold to say that. I mean, people will question and say, who am I to make such an assertive statement? But I think I think, and I'm bold enough, and I will say the structure on which a lot of African countries run is poor. What do I mean? I mean the constitution. The constitution of a lot of countries in Africa are not well thought of. You know, they're they not well thought out. Like here, you had in the United States, the founding fathers, a lot of them were very, very educated. They were bright. They were visionaries. They could see way into the future. and, and they projected it. And not only could they see way into the future, they did a lot of study. They studied works of great French philosophers. Uh, I don't know, some of you may be aware, Montesco was one of the greatest celebrated philosophers in the drafting of the United States Constitution. These founding fathers in the United States thought through everything. Now, a lot of African countries just get a draft, you know. They get a draft, they, 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 they put the draft together in maybe a year, right? And they put it and they take it. But you need careful deliberation, you need it thought out. And I, honestly, I think because of the way Africa is, a lot of African countries, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, a lot of African countries are actually six, seven countries in one, right? Like in Nigeria, right, we have like seven major ethnic groups. You have the Igbos, the Yorubas, the Hausas, the South-South people, they have their own language. So you have actually six different countries in one unit. Now, I want you to imagine a scenario like where you have England, France, Germany as a country. It will never function well. So we have two solutions. Either the African the countries come together and say, you know what, let us break apart peacefully or we say to ourselves let us come together and see how we can work together as one great nation and I choose the latter I want in a case like Nigeria you come together and you put a structure together that works and I think the best structure to make African countries at least some of them, a lot, a lot of them, West Africa, even East Africa, a lot of Af African countries, the best structure to work on will be a federal structure. Because with federal structures, it, you have more smaller units, states, smaller states. And when you have small states, they now have to rely on each other. You now decrease the power of the executive branch. Because what happens with a lot of countries, and it's almost like a dictatorship, right? You, they give a lot of power to the presidency. And too much power will inevitably lead to corruption. So you reduce the powers at the executive branch, have a federal structure, as opposed to a parliament. Now with a parliament, what happens is that you have regions. Regions are like big chunks of areas. So you can have like the Igbo region, the Yoruba region, and the uh, Hausa region. And... The parliamentary system is what is practiced now in Canada. And some people may say, well, you know, in Canada it work, it's, it's working. But it's not really working. I don't know. Some of you maybe keep up with current affairs where the people of Quebec, the French-speaking part of Canada, are trying to break away 
from Canada. As a matter of fact, up recently, the current Prime Minister acknowledged Quebec as a separate nation within the nation of, uh, of Canada. So if we want to function well as a group, a lot of African countries have to come together, sit down at the joint ta table, study systems, know which system works well for us. And I think because of the multi-ethnicity within the nation, right, the best system to work or that will work for a lot of African nations will be the federal structure. Because when you have smaller units, you know, each unit depends on the other as opposed to regions. Because regions a lot of times become so self-confident, they become so courageous and they say you know what we're tired of you guys and then they try to break up and what happens you have a war you just have that endless cycle so i think that will be uh the solution to to uh, the problem thank you with regards to uh aid the first question or the first part of the question uh they have tried they've tried uh there's, an, there's awareness, at least I know for Nigeria and a lot of West Africa, even East African countries too, they try to telecast, broadcast, there's a cultural awareness. Uh, the second part of the question concerning poverty, as long as there's corruption, as long as corruption remains a norm, or there is no anti-corruption effort, uh, sincere sincere anti-corruption efforts. I just don't know how the cycle of poverty can be broken. Okay, thank you. Then, corruption raises its ugly head again in that when you have a dictator, right, he will be more than likely from a particular region. So let me use the US for example although there's no dictatorship here. Let's say you have a dictator from California, right? And he wants to take control or control the U.S. What he, what he would do is corruption comes in like most dictatorships. He tries to make a lot of money. He now gives some people money. Those people now give some little money to the people around. Maybe they can take like one or two other regions and arm them, arm them strongly. So when those people, if the whole U.S. wants to stage an uprising, they quash them because of the guns and the control they have. I think in Nigeria, Nigeria is a classic uh, case like, uh, that addresses the question. In Nigeria in 96, I think, they had a dictator who, who was ousted, or was it 95? Yeah, 95, who was ousted because the people said, you know what, enough is enough. You know, everything now sort of collapsed and, you know, he died. He died in office. There are still speculations as to what killed him. But it was not an uprising in the traditional sense, you see. So it wasn't like everybody got together, staged an uprising. He sort of died in office in mysterious circumstances, you know. So that's how that issue was addressed, at least. Well, um... The education, the system of education has, in my view, we have a huge po population crisis. Uh, I know in Nigeria we have, you know, so you, you, the population is so, so high that sometimes the infrastructure may not be enough to contain the population of people who need to be in school. That's one aspect. However, that's no excuse. Again, it still comes down to corruption. The people have to be... The corruption and leadership, right? And when you have leaders who are visionary, people who know there's a problem and who choose to address that problem, then you can address the issue. They have to think hard as to how to address the issue. The, the natural resources are there, the money is there, and we have to see the importance of education. But as long as you don't have the right visionary leader, we we'll still have the same problem because when you have people corruption at the voting booth in in most regions that practice democracy, what happens? You put a leader there who is corrupt, who we want to feed into the corruption of the the, the people who put him into office. So uh, everything 
oh well not everything but a lot of things still boil down to corruption and people not asserting their rights I have a question before we go on to another school if um, you have all this huge amount of natural resources over 80 percent right and but it's not trickling down educationally wise to to you said there's probably not a middle class like right. in Africa. Mm -hmm. It's either rich, rich or, or poor. poor. Yeah. How can you get the hearts of the rich to turn to the poor to, to help them up by offering them jobs, by letting some of the resources trickle down for education? I was just thinking in Nigeria, it's an oil-rich country. Right. So for every barrel of oil that you gather, you know, that you drill from the ground, why not add two or three cents that would go to education? It's very interesting. Uh, that you, you mentioned that yesterday I was reading the news, the Nigerian news that is, and they actually have a fund for the very thing you mentioned. Well, good. They it's, should. <laughs> it's called the Petroleum Trust Development Fund to take care of the very issues you just mentioned. It's 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 a brilliant. It was a brilliant idea, but this is the corruption twist. again. Corruption again. They just indicted the president and the <laughs> vice president for taking the money. For taking the money. Because I or abusing the trust of the people. Because I'm a believer that to raise up students like this in Africa, you know, to get their hearts, to get the hearts and minds of children when they're young enough. You know, can't, could that change a country? I know it can't do it overnight, but you're growing citizens that would be able to be self-governing. I must say something, it can't change overnight because I was, in my spare time, I've taken a fascination to Asia, Japan especially. Mm -hmm. Now, in Japan, in, in 50 years, in less than 50 years, they turned everything around. They became mm -hmm. a world power in less than 50 years. How education and embracing change great change telling the people to accept reason western science mm -hmm. and they did that and they became a world power by 19 in the by the early 1900s and, and the they, work ethic is unbelievable yeah but the work ethic still comes with right you know that embracing questioning mm -hmm. the leaders you, you still need the visionary leaders and you still have to wipe out that the element of corruption Japan did it in 50 years. Mm -hmm. I Following think World War II, for, is what yeah, No, even before World War II. Okay. Because before they became a world power okay. by World War II, mm -hmm. they, there was a, a period they called the uh, Meiji Restoration, mm -hmm. where I think it was in the 1850s or 1857, less than 40 years, by 1890 or 1898, they became, they became so powerful. They controlled, by 1911, they had already started controlling most of Asia and had defeated Russia wow. in war. Well, let's go back for some more questions. The U.S. took a very nice, in, in, in conjunction with the U.N., took a very bold step and very nice step. I think about five, six years ago, four years ago, the, now there's a U.N. convention against corruption, right? So that's a bold first step. Second. Now, what the, the foreign nations are doing, the Western nations are doing is, if you have a corrupt government, a corrupt leader who steals money from his country and takes that money and sends it, because what they normally do is that they steal the money and put it in foreign bank accounts. So what the U.S. and England and some other Western nations are doing is, if they do that, once the, the leaders steal the money and put it in their accounts, they alert the new government and say, hey, you know what, the former regime has X amount of money in our bank, they probably stole it. Another thing they do, I think, they also freeze the money as well. So the people who steal it don't have access to the money. So uh, there you go. That's the step they have taken. Uh, technology spans from so much agricultural technology, are you saying? Electrical technology, what kind of... <laughs> well, the rich, you said, have satellite dishes. Yeah, they have everything. They, if you can afford it, you can get anything you want. You know, but they there's have just everything. such a, a, a chasm between... Yes, between the rich and the poor. So you have everything, satellite dish. I mean, you'll be so shocked when... The, I would be shocked. If you go to Nigeria, you everything, every music here, every news 
in the US or in England, the, the Nigerian knows because you know they have access to the satellite dish, they have access to everything, cars, internet. internet, everything. But the problem is how many people get their hands on it? Yeah. Okay, good question. Another question. And it's an interior country. Yes, Nigeria, Nigeria is it's about, it's not the central, but it's close to the central part mm -hmm. of Africa. Um, it's Western Africa. It's supposed to be the leading country. Uh, I think at this point, because of the leaders we've had, who the dictators we had, it hasn't lived up to to the challenges, and that that it that faces it. But I think in the years to come, it can actually lead to that continent. It can be a pace setter or a trend setter for the region. What you can well, it's will be one of awareness. Awareness, awareness, education, you know, let people know and let, let people hear what is going on. Uh, at the end of the day, we Nigerians, or Africans for that matter, will be responsible for our own future. It's not enough for the West or for anybody to tell us or to keep giving us handouts. We have to take responsibility as Africans and as people to advance our various countries. It's going to have to boil down to that. Because you can talk, I gave an example earlier on of, you know, a, a child who is a trump, a child who is not serious with his schoolwork, you know. You can have a parent. A parent may keep trying to make excuses for the child. Well, you know, at one point he'll be okay, give him handouts, make excuses. Or the parent can say, you have to take responsibilities for what your future will be. So at a point, we're going to have to, uh, Nigerians, Africans will have to take that responsibility. We have educated people. I mean, we, they are remarkable surgeons. Remar My cousin is a surgeon for uh, Bethesda Neville Hospital. He's schooled at Emory. And there are numerous Nigerians who are medical doctors, trained surgeons, engineers. I mean, people that have astonishing credentials. So it's going to remain for Africans in Africa and here as well to say, you know what, enough is enough and we're going to take responsibility for making our country a great nation. And to do that, one of the very aspects of facet, facets we must address is corruption and implementation of strong educational system. Responsibility. Right. That's uh -huh. responsibility. responsibility. You know, kind of. Uh, yeah, I know. we're our brother's keeper. Yeah. Well, well we as do? far as that exactly, mm -hmm. as far as that goes, you know, as uh, being a brother's keeper, you know, uh, that's one facet. Two, we're all part of a great human society, so we must take interest in what the others do. Uh, you know, I think it was Martin Luther King who said. Whatever affects a few affects the whole. Mm -hmm. A rich man will never be what a rich man ought to be if a poor man is not what he ought to be. You can never be good if, what, if you do not eradicate bad. You can never be what you ought to be if I'm not what I ought to be. So from that perspective, from that philosophy, uh, the U.S. has an interest in making sure Africa develops. But there's a trend now in the world, and uh, they call it the information age. The internet, Google, so there's information out there. So what I think the U.S. to do, if we were to ask for help, if, if we, 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 they asked us, say, you know, what do you think we should do in terms of education? I would say try and make the channels of the internet cheaper and more accessible for the people, for the average people in Nigeria. And they are doing that as a matter of fact, because I know there's a push now to make the laptop for the average people in Africa. I'm a friend of mine who is an engineer in Nigeria came here and they're trying to push for in laptops that will cost I think a hundred dollars or less than a hundred dollars. So if you can have that, that's one 
field or one 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 element of it if you can have that now in africa in africa you can now start pushing for internet costs reducing internet costs pushing for the information age so i think from that perspective uh that will be a way to go You raise a very interesting point, but I think international law is moving the, the whole issue of uh, globalization. International law is now moving towards a center, right? So with what I've learned now, what we can do, a lot of us can do, is sue a lot of the multinational companies in the U.S. courts. So what Sarwiwa did was... They, had, they actually sued some of the multinational companies in U.S. courts, and I think they did get awards, or it's still in the courts, and they, the multinational companies are really scared. Another, uh, another issue that is going on now is the bullying of the Nigerian citizens, of people in Nigeria. What is now happening is, I think, and people like me, I think it's things we have to push, is where if we know our judicial system cannot give us the justice we need, the U.S. courts or foreign courts will be able to hear our cases. So there's a case going on now, a human rights case, against the former military ruler in Nigeria in 99, I think, I believe, or just before 99, Abu Bakr, where he abused or violated the civil rights of some Nigerians. So they are now suing him in the U.S. courts, and the courts is, I mean, the uh, case is still hot. So he can't come to the U.S. now. So God forbid he falls sick. He dare not come to the U.S. And that's the trend. And I'm so, I think that if at all, if the U.S. wants to help us or the foreign nations want to, to contribute to, to, to our advancement or development, the way to go about it, instead of giving us handouts, will, to, will be to open their courts to us to help trade relationships so we can trade with them. So that's a way I think we can address the issue you just raised. And then two, our, our, uh, the people have to now come and know their rights. You know what happens, a lot of people, those areas that you violate the civil rights of the people, like environmental disasters, the people's lands that are destroyed are usually not too educated. Right? So they see the, their rivers are destroyed. They don't even know what law is or what human, basic human rights are to start with. And who do they turn to? They don't know who to turn to. So it is now left for people like us and then for people like you to work in concert with us when we go back and say, look, this is what's going on here. And then you now push for awareness in the U.S. or in the world and we'll be able to sue those people. The government, the African government that takes part, conspires with the multinational companies that do those things. So that will be a way to go, and that's the way the world is moving, and I'll be very, very happy if that can happen. I think uh, I would say if they can go towards genocide, you know, type in genocide in uh, Google or government, but rather than talk about Africa, I would say they should pick countries. Because Africa is a big, you know, it's a, it's a continent with so close to 50 countries or more. I don't know, I, 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 because sometimes they try to split. But you choose a country. The best way to go, if I had advice, you say, you know, choose a part of West Africa. Ch choose, a, choose a country in West Africa. Choose a country in East Africa. Choose a country in Central Africa. Choose a country in South Africa. And Googling, you know, something. But I must tell you that... Uh, in all fairness, all is not bad in Africa. There's a trend, there's a push. Uh, when you go there, because I know when I was in Nigeria, I actually interned in ExxonMobil in uh, 2004, my first year here at law school. And I met a lot of foreigners, and they vowed they would never leave Nigeria. They loved it there. They had everything they wanted. They loved it there, and they said they would never leave. I mean, these are personal experiences. So it's not, if it was that bad, it wouldn't be, that wouldn't have been the case. I actually met foreigners from the West who said they would never leave Nigeria. 
So it's a question of now building on that, making it, reducing the conflict, the tension, improving the middle class, making a middle, not improving the middle class, but making a yeah. strong, developing a, a strong middle class. Once we can do that, you know, we're not asking for a hundred percent. We're just asking for as close to it, uh, ideal. Moving towards the ideal is what we're asking for. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us well, this morning you. and for all the students. I think you're going to, I want you to remember his name, Kanoyo, Kan Kanayo Kanayo Odo, Odo yeah. from Nigeria, because I think you'll probably hear of him in the future. And I think he's got a vision for Nigeria to be a trendsetter or a pace setter for the African continent. And I thank you so much, um, Upton uh, Middle School in St. Joseph and North Carolina School of Science and Math there in Durham and Sandburg Middle School in Golden Valley, Minnesota for joining us because this has been a great dialogue. You have asked amazing questions, uh, very insightful questions. Um, I'm feeling really good about turning our stuff over to, to students that are coming up. They're very well educated. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.